Let's pray together. Jesus, you are our living hope. It's so good to sing that wherever we are right now, to join our hearts by singing about you, our living hope. We cling to that. We trust in you. We need you at all times, particularly in this time. And now we ask you, Lord Jesus, our living hope, to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. You know, just this week, Monday seems like a month ago to me now, but just this week, we were together as a staff, about 30 of us in a room, so we were under the 50-person guidance at that time, and we had about a dozen or so that were joining uh, via, uh, you know, Zoom conference call. We were talking as a church staff about uh, what the new situation we're in, and how we were going to best care for you, lead our church, and serve our community in these days. During that meeting, uh, the guidance came through that was, the number was not 50, but it was down to 10. So things change fast, even in the midst of a meeting. Also in that meeting, one of our staff members asked me, Pastor Jeff, do you really think this is going to last eight weeks, this crisis? Would you like to know the answer to that question? I'll tell you. Here's the answer. I have no idea. I have no idea if it's going to last eight weeks, 10 weeks, two more weeks. I, I don't know. I don't know uh, when this will pass. I don't know what the fallout will be. I don't know when things will go back to normal. And I don't know what normal will be like when we get there. So maybe you're thinking, well, (laughs) that's great, Pastor Jeff. What do you know? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Because I know a little bit about C.S. Lewis. I know lots of movie quotes. And I know some sports trivia. But that's not what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about what we're calling Surprised by Hope, our new series. What we know as followers of Jesus our anchor, our certainty, our assurance, our hope. This series called Surprised by Hope, taking, the title's taken from a book written by a man named N.T. Wright, is focused on what we know, what we're sure of as Christians, as Christ followers. Now, most of us don't think about hope and certainty as going together. But let me read to you what Peter says. This is the signature text uh, for our series and what we're going to focus on this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. What an incredible passage. And in fact, I want to encourage you to memorize that passage uh, as we proceed in this series. Most people, as I said, don't associate hope with something we know for sure. Because we say things like, well, I hope it works out for you. Well, I, I hope it goes well. I hope you get there on time. I hope you have a good day. But we're not talking about things that we know for sure. We're talking about sort of wishes about the future. This is not at all how the Bible talks about hope. The Bible talks about hope in a very different way. You heard it there uh, in Peter's letter. The biblical view of hope is about something we know for sure. It's about certainty. And hope and certainty don't go together easily in our minds, but that's because we don't really understand what the Bible's saying about hope. Listen to what N.T. Wright says about this in his uh, introduction to his book, Surprised by Hope. Most people, in my experience, including many Christians, don't know what the ultimate Christian hope really is. Most people don't expect Christians to have much to say about hope in this present world. And I think he's right. And I think it's sad. But we should. We absolutely should. And that's what this series over the next four weeks leading us up to Easter, the focus of our hope, is going to be about. 
In fact, I was with uh, N.T. Wright in Scotland, in St. Andrews, Scotland. I, I, you'll see a picture here of me with the pastor's cohort. We were in Scotland, in St. Andrews. I can't even, I know I'm showing this to you because I just want to brag a little bit how cool it was to be in Scotland. We're confined to our homes, so maybe vicariously you can live through that little picture right there. We are with him. And we sat with him for a whole day learning from him. And he was lecturing and talking and sharing things with us. And I asked him, you know, a, a couple of questions. One, I asked him if I was to suggest one of your books for somebody to read, he said, Surprised by Hope. It's the distillation of his sort of life's work, he said. And then he said to us, you know, you can tell what someone has placed their hope in by how they live, specifically by how they spend their time and money. And then he said, because what someone hopes for impacts what they live for. That's true. What somebody hopes for shows up in how they live. And as human beings, we cannot live without hope. We're hardwired for it. We need it. Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl wrote a famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. This little paperback book will change your life. I encourage you, uh, you've got time on your hands, pick up this book and, and read it. He was in his early 20s and newly married when the Nazis came into his home country of Austria. They uh, took him because he was Jewish into the Dresdenstadt ghetto. He and his wife were forced to live there for a year. Then they were separated and they were sent, shipped off to Dachau, a concentration camp. At the end of the story, for him anyway, only he and his younger sister survived. The book, Man's Search for Meeting, is really two halves. The first half of the book is um, focused on his story, and it's a remarkable story. The second half is about what he learned in his experience. What he learned is remarkable because he, Frankel was a psychologist, and he worked as sort of a therapist or counselor for many of the other prisoners that were there. And he wrote about this. In fact, he wrote it on little scraps of paper, which he hid in his mattress during this, uh, his ordeal. And he said the singular difference between those that learned to cope with their situation and that survived and those that didn't was one word, hope. Those that had a transcendent hope. Some people lost all hope altogether and they, and they devolved into a kind of animal instinct and survival instinct and they were horrible to each other. Others created fantasy worlds, uh, which they tried to tell themselves in, they lived in denial or detachment from reality, and eventually that crumbled. But a few had a hope beyond their present circumstances that sustained them. And this is what Peter's writing about here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Philosopher Andrew de Blanco wrote the uh, History of American Culture, uh, which he subtitled A Meditation on Hope. Here's what he says. Human beings need to organize themselves into a story that gives us hope. Okay, well, what is this story then that would give us ultimate hope? This is precisely what Peter is talking about. Listen again to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A moment ago, I challenged you to read, uh, memorize the passage. If you're not that ambitious, just memorize verse 3. Just memorize this verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. What a verse. What an incredible verse. What is a living hope? What does Peter mean when he says a living hope? It's what Viktor Frankl wrote about when he called it a transcendent hope. It's what Andrew de Blanco wrote about when he called it the story of hope. But the difference here is that Peter actually locates this hope. He puts it in a specific place, which makes all the difference. First, a living hope is not a vague wish about the future. We talked about this a moment ago. We talk about hope as either our desire for something that might happen or what we hope will happen that would give us that desire. For example, we might say, I hope that Jim's flight arrives on time safely. And then you might say, our only hope for Jim's flight to arrive on time is a good tailwind. So it's either the thing you want, Jim, to arrive safely on time, or the tailwind which would make that happen. But neither of those things do you know for sure. Neither of those things are a certainty. They're things that you, you, know, you, you have a vague wish about. So again, when most of us talk about or use the word hope, we're not talking about certainty. We're actually talking about things we're uncertain about. And that's certainly true in our culture right now, isn't it? There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things we don't know about. But that's not how Peter's talking about hope. Biblical hope, living hope, is a certainty. 
It's a desire for something that you believe will happen and are confident will happen. This is how the psalmist can say in Psalm 42, verse 5, you might remember back to our series, Psalms of the Soul, when uh, Andrew, uh, or, or excuse me, Pastor Jason Cusick was visiting us from California. And by the way, it was in that picture of us in Scotland. When he talked about Psalm 42, the psalmist can say, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so uh, cast down? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him again. Hope in God is a certain thing. It's a sure thing. Okay, Peter gives us uh, a, an incredible picture of what this living hope is, and I want to give you four aspects of it, just uh, four points here. First, it is given by God through the new birth. Living hope is given by God through the new birth. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope. God did it. So living hope for the Christian is not something that you conjure. It's not something that you summon up. It's not something you try to convince yourself of. It's not something you produce. It's something that is given to you by God. And it comes by what he calls the new birth, born again. Now we don't have time to get into this, but if you go to John chapter 3, there's a fascinating story between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus, who was a moral, religious, upstanding citizen in the community, a member of the Jewish high council. He comes to Jesus at night and he wants to talk about what the kingdom of God really is. And Jesus says, this is paraphrasing, Jesus says, we can't even have this conversation, Nicodemus, unless you're born again. And Nicodemus is like, what do you mean born again? How can you go back into the womb a second time when you, once you're grown? And Jesus is talking about this spiritual new birth that God causes in us. Let me read to you what uh, German theologian Jürgen Moltmann says about this. I find this to be the best description of what it means to be born again. Christian faith isn't just a conviction. It is not just a feeling or a decision. It invades the life so deeply that we have to talk about it in terms of dying and being born again. The power of the Holy Spirit makes Christ's resurrection present, and this wakens a living hope in God's future. And the moment of rebirth is the moment when eternity touches time. A truly new life begins only when this happens. God does this. Only God does this. He causes it. And when he causes you to be born again through Jesus, he puts you into a story of hope, a sure thing. That's why G Peter says he has caused us to be born again into a living hope. Only God can do this. You can't do it. You can't make it happen. Think about it. Babies don't decide to be born. Do you remember the day of your birth? Remember when you decided, it's time, I'm coming into the world now. No, you were bo born by forces outside of you. It, was, it happened to you. It was caused. The same thing is true spiritually for us. God causes us to be born again and gives us a living hope. Second thing, it's founded on the resurrection. This is so important. It's what really this series is all about. Living hope is founded on the resurrection. What's the first thing Peter talks about when he describes his living hope? The very first thing he says when he tries to explain what the hope is, how it happens, he says God's caused it, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection. Right there it is in verse 3. For Peter, the resurrection of Jesus was a total game changer. It means the world is totally different. It's changed everything. He no longer looks at the world the same way. And that should be true for us as well. I, right now, I think what's happening in our culture is we're looking around and we feel like this coronavirus has changed the way we look at the world. And to a degree it has. But for Christians, nothing should change the way we look at the world like the resurrection of Jesus. Nothing should change our view of what ultimate reality is than the fact that we serve a risen Savior. Our present, living, dynamic, and real confidence, that's what hope is, present, living, real confidence is in the risen Jesus. It's grounded in what God has already done in Jesus. Let me say that again. What we hope God will do is certain because of what we know God has already done. That's the Christian hope. In other words, our hope is a living hope because our Lord is a living Lord. He's living. This is where our hope is located. Not in a vague wish for the future, but in the person of Jesus Christ. He's our living hope. Okay, but how exactly does the resurrection of someone else become my hope and your hope? How does that work? Well, Jesus became what we are. Weak, vulnerable, broken, 
helpless, so that we might become what he is. And when you trust in him, when you are joined to him, you're born again into this living hope. Number three, Peter says, not only is our living hope that it's given by God through the new birth, it's founded in the resurrection. Number three is, it cannot be taken away from you. It's a rock solid guarantee. Listen again uh, in verses four and five, First Peter 1, 4 and 5. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He uses this metaphor of, of an inheritance, money in the bank, but not like the money in the bank that we have or in your 401k right now when you look at the market and it's terrifying what's going to happen to the economy. He's saying an inheritance that can't be touched. It can't be diminished in any way. It's kept for you by God. Nothing can take it away from you. The world has always been an insecure place. When you're a little kid, you don't, you don't know that. Your, your security is in mom and dad, but something happens eventually that you realize the world's not as secure and as solid as you thought it was. C.S. Lewis writes about this in his book, Surprised by Joy, when he talks about when his mother died. She was the center of the ground, the strength, the glue of the family. And at nine years old, when she died, he realized the world is an insecure place. Some of you experience things that make you realize that. What we're seeing now is we're just waking up to the reality of what the world's always been like. We're not in control. It's not that secure. But we serve a God who is in control who holds us. And Peter says, what we have as his followers can never be taken. You can never lose it. It can't be diminished. It can't be corrupted. It can't be, you know, it doesn't disappear like numbers on a screen in the stock market. It's kept for you. In fact, none of us can speak with any real certainty about the future. How would we know? I don't know. You don't know. But we can speak with certainty about this hope because God has spoken with certainty in his son, Jesus Christ. He's given us. In fact, I think it's the very uncertainty of our time right now that should cause us to reach out for this living hope, to ask the questions about ultimate hope. So your hope is given by God. It's grounded in the resurrection. It's, it's a kept and you cannot lose it. Finally, it produces a joy that is beyond words. It produces joy that's beyond words. Look at what Peter says here uh, in, in the next couple of verses, verses six through eight. Let me read these verses for you. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Peter's writing to a group of Christians that are living in an uncertain time. They're facing persecution. Their world was uh, far more shaky than what we're experiencing in this moment. Their mortality was always in their face, as is ours. Peter's writing to them and he's saying, you have this confidence, this certainty, though now you may be grieved by trials, you rejoice. He says, you rejoice, though you're full of grief and trials. How do those go together? How can that be? Well, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean we just put on a happy face. It doesn't mean Christians, we just pretend everything's fine. You know, turn that frown upside down because you belong to Jesus. Some people think that's what Christians are supposed to do doesn't mean you ignore or deny the reality of the world. Let me read to you what C.S. Lewis writes about this in his book, Mere Christianity. I told you, I know a little bit about C.S. Lewis. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. But one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean we leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most about the next. So it doesn't mean we stick our head in the sand or we're, we're, we're sort of not, we're detached from this world. It means because we have a hope about the life to come, we're able to live freely and engaged and work for the good in this life right now. This is so important for us. 
Peter says that we can have joy that's beyond words even, inexpressible. Do you notice this part where he says, though you don't know him, you haven't seen him, you know him? He's drawing a contrast between himself and he was an eyewitness. He was one of the 12 disciples. He had seen Jesus. He's writing to people who had not seen Jesus. He's writing to you and to me. He's saying, though you haven't seen him, you know him. And though you do not now see him, you love him. Isn't that true? We see with the eyes of faith. Our certainty, our hope, is not that we see him physically, but we know him and we love him. And we know his love for us because of his resurrection from the dead. This produces a joy in us that you almost can't put into words. Even in the midst of trials, Peter says God's doing something. He's producing something. I said on Wednesday in our Wednesday Night Live that God's purpose in the midst of pain, while he doesn't cause it all to happen, he can use it. And part of what he's using it for is not just to get you through it, not just to get it over with, but to refine you. This is the image Peter uses when he talks about this. Refined by fire. My son Benjamin and I like to watch the show Forged in Fire. These guys that are in this competition, right, to make swords or axes or whatever. And they have to refine the steel. Steel has to be uh, treated and heated up and hammered out to get the impurities out. Same thing is true for precious metals, gold and silver. Peter says God, through trial, is turning us into gold. He's doing something in us. He's do- if we let him if we stay focused on him. So we should be focused enough on the present crisis that we can do what good God has called us to do in the world, but not so focused on it that we lose sight of our hope, that we lose the certainty and the assurance and the confidence we have in him. We so need that right now, more than ever. Things are being stripped away from us. Things are being taken from us. Things we used to depend on and take for granted are no longer there. Even in like daily comforts. Uh, just going to the store, you know, uh, we, for years we go to the store and we just uh, take whatever you want because it's always all there and you've got five choices of whatever or 10 choices or 50 choices of the thing you want to buy. Now you go and you, well, we'll see what they have. That's how much of the world lives. We're adjusting. Things are being stripped away. I think this is true in the church also. I think God is stripping some things away from us, taking some things away so that we would remember what matters most. We would not take for granted our hope, which is Christ and him alone. That's what the church is built on. And I see this happening. I look around, I see on Facebook and social media, you know, I see a a diminishing uh, fighting, political fighting and division, and I see people coming together to love each other. Sure, there's, there's plenty of bad news still. But I see the church rising up. And this is what God is calling us to do in this moment. But it will only happen if we stay focused on our living hope, on Jesus. So I'm going to lead us, close us with a little exercise, kind of a posture prayer. I I learned this, uh, there's different versions of this, but I learned this from a speaker named Daniel Strickland who leads through this. I'm going to just do a a simplified version of it. So right where you are in your own home, in your couch or in your chair, I'd like you just to Make two fists like this with me, okay? Do this, you ready? And pray this prayer with me. God, I know that my natural position and posture is one of defensiveness, fear, control, and wanting to have my way. And I know this is not what you want. And it's not what the church is called to be. And so right now, open your hands. Everyone open your hands like this. Right now, I open my hands to you. I don't want to be closed-fisted to you or to other people, Lord. I open my hands to you. And I ask that you would fill them with peace, with security, with hope, certain hope. God, help me by your spirit to live open-handed toward you and toward your world. Not just in this present crisis, but at all times. Teach me, Lord, what it means to live in hope. We thank you, Lord Jesus, you who are our living hope. Amen.